Oh, no crazy. No, I just have some questions that I wrote down, but we can also just have some conversation breaking off the questions and whatnot. Um, so the first question that I wrote down was um, to briefly introduce yourself and tell us one fun fact about yourself. And um, also, if you're not comfortable answering the questions or you don't know the answer, that's okay. So I guess I'll go first. Um, I'm Julia Sauter. I work for Glen Mary. Um, I'm in our mission education and ministry office. So one of the things that I do is I coordinate these mission trips, which usually take place in real life where we're going down to a mission. But this year, because of the pandemic, we're having it online. And one fun fact about myself is I'm not originally from Cincinnati. I'm from Southern California, where my parents live. Um, and there are lots of things about Cincinnati that are interesting that I didn't know when I moved here. But one of the things that I learned that I was overjoyed to learn was Fiona the hippo was born and lives here in Cincinnati at the zoo. Oh, <laughs> whoop de do! <laughs> <Yeah>. <laughs> well, I thought it was exciting. <laughs> That was kind of the age group you grew up with, Julie, was Fiona. That's right. Fiona oh. was also on, um, what was she? She wasn't, she wasn't just a hippo. a hippo. She was something else. A magic hippo. Um, <laughs> you mean there's another Fiona? Yeah. They named the one in Cincinnati after the one that was Is in the Fiona the part of uh, Shrek? Yeah. Oh, oh, that Fiona. oh that's right. That's the green right. monster? Uh, yeah. He married oh, Fiona. That's right. Uh, that's not a monster. You, no. have to, you have to be young in order to remember Fiona. We, we went to the, to or the movie. Or grow up so the young ones. We had to go to the movie. Shrek. <laughs> Shrek. We, it, it had a lot of adult humor in it. It was good. It does. <laughs> like SpongeBob. Yes, <laughs> yes, it did. I didn't get to see Fiona, but I heard Fiona. I had to drive from Cincinnati to Quincy, Illinois to help take care of my daughter who had breast cancer and a baby. <clears throat> and it's an eight hour trip. And sometimes I would have the grandbabies with me or I'd take somebody with me. It's an eight-hour trip. That was uh, two movies and two uh, CDs of music. Yeah. Okay. That's how long it took to get there. And Shrek was one of the things, and it was a long time before I ever saw the movie. But I, I, I knew the words. <laughs> I, I think Julia's sister, we had to watch Lion King. I don't know how many times we watched Lion King. And Julia, you used to watch, what was the video with Belle in it? Beauty and the Beast. Beauty and the Beast. the Beast. We must have saw that movie uh, 20, 25 times. Julia was always, Mommy, come watch Beauty and the Beast with me. We have a video if anybody wants to see it, VHS. Oh, I'm watching it. <laughs> <laughs> well, I'll go next if you want. Yeah. Sure. I'm, uh, my name is Mark Schilling. I live now in Maryland. I've been here for about 25 years, but I grew up in upstate New York, born in Buffalo. I'm one of 11 kids and um, I still work full time at a Catholic school here in the Maryland. And I guess the unusual fact is among other things that I've done, I spent 10 years doing humpback whale field research and, you know, wow. leading whale watches on the East Coast and publishing papers and stuff like that. There be whales. There be whales, Captain. <laughs> there be whales. Yep. Well, oh, Mike, right. would love to meet you, Mark. She loves whales. Her entire house is decorated with whales. <laughs> well, you can see the whale in the background uh, here. Yeah. Yeah. Reaching humpback whale there. Did you know that? <laughs> Julie, did you ever go out whale watching like in the sixth grade? No, Laura may have done that, but I didn't get to go. She did. She got sick. Mal de mer. She was the one on the back of the boat throwing up, usually. Uh, that's the best place. Yeah. 
Well, you guys have probably figured out that uh, this is Jack and Sally Sauter. We're the proud parents of your uh, <coughs> lady here in the front row. <laughs> and uh, we both grew up in Northwest Iowa. We oh. come from a farming background, growing corn and soybeans and all that good stuff. And when Sally graduated from college at a Catholic college in Omaha, we moved to Palm Springs, California, so she could set up a medical records department in a place called Eisenhower Medical Center. I'm uh -huh. sure everybody's heard about it. Yeah. And I came along for the ride. I mm. got in, I've been an automobile mechanic all my life. And uh, in March, after 50 years, I retired and I got my tools. And here we are. It's been a good ride. What kind of a mechanic? Automobile mechanic. We, yeah, what, what, we owned uh, Goodyear stores and uh, oh. Chevron gas stations for years. Uh, mm -hmm. Worked together oh. for about the last 20 and uh, self-employed for 35 years. Wow. Uh, it was a good life. And we got two lovely daughters. You know one of them. And the other one is their little sister called Laura. Mm -hmm. And they're in Laura's Dallas, Texas. In Texas. Oh. Oh. Up the street, we love right. to travel nope. to see our kids. Mm -hmm. Arlington says most of the people in Cincinnati oh, stay, in, stay mm -hmm. in Cincinnati. They all have family there. Yeah, in, that's true. In she, Arlington, or where was no, it? Cincinnati. No, where no. in Texas? Oh, Dallas. Oh, Dallas. 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 Okay. In Dallas, yeah. Fort right Worth. outside. She's more okay. Fort Worth. <laughs> okay. Well, I'm Joe. Um, engineering was my career and of course I'm retired now and uh, what I do is retirement <laughs> oh okay um, what did Julia ask for oh something, something fun? interesting <laughs> or interesting so uh, um, what I've been doing the last few years is uh, teacher substituting at our Catholic school oh, St. Louis Catholic School uh, it's a K through eight K through eighth high school. So that's been kind of fun and challenging also. Uh, I'm a volunteer. I, I don't, I don't, I'm not hired or anything. The kids so, can't get over that. <laughs> you do this for open these days? Well, well, that's our church, St. Louis Church. So we've been at that church for 40 years, I guess. Mm -hmm. And, but the, with the part with the school, volunteering with the school, I guess started six, seven years ago, uh, teacher substituting. And so far I'm still at it, except for the semester, I'm sitting it out. Uh, even though the school went to extraordinary, extraordinary changes that the school to be able to bring back students with the pandemic. Uh, actually over the summer, I was there working on setting up all these shields everywhere. <laughs> Uh, washing stations, uh, sanitizers, and all kinds of things. But uh, I, I still decided to sit out this semester. That's a me. Thank so you. So maybe in the spring, <laughs> I'll, I'll go back to substituting, see what it looks like then. Yeah, our school is in session. We have um, pre-K through eight, about 410 kids come every day, and about 90 to 100 are remote students. And okay. I'm, I'm there every day. So it's that's, that's that's say, extraordinary measures to try to reduce you, the risk. You're still teaching? Yeah. yeah. Oh, okay. Mm -hmm. Okay. Okay. What's your subject? Well, I teach tech to the middle school, but I'm also tech support. So when I'm not in a classroom, I'm trying to keep everything running. And we've got about right. 700 devices on campus and church and faith formation right. in the school. Busy, busy. All right. Very, very busy. Very, very busy. That's got to be indispensable. I tech. These, um, yeah, it is. I I I'm too dependent on it. <laughs> Yeah, IT these days, it's got to be. <laughs> yeah. So, so far, so good. We're six weeks. We just finished our sixth week, and we haven't yet had anybody positive. So we're, yeah. we're hopeful that we'll be able to continue. So, so far, so good. Oh, we started out virtually, but went back to in-person mm -hmm. uh, mid-September. Mid-September, and so far, so good. Yeah. Uh, it looks like the students have gotten into this new routine already. Yeah, I agree. Uh, after what less than a month i guess and i still go by there but i'm not inside with this we don't have a single substitute we don't have any volunteers and no subs so when we have somebody out all the teachers there have to pick it up with their free periods or the administration 
Oh, we don't wow. have a single soul under the Hard. building unless they have to fix, you know, the engineering person, fix the H HVAC or fix something like that. Nobody else gets in the building. Wow. There are no subs or, or no yeah, or, or, not allowing any or, or no subs, no volunteers, no, no volunteers, no okay. Nobody. <laughs> and no no uh, income. I mean, no people that are registered for substituting by pay or anything like oh, that. Well, we we have subs traditionally, but we're not allowing anybody yet into the mix. Gotcha. Oh, okay. Don't play. Nobody's allowed. We normally would have subs. We normally would have a lot of volunteers helping out with recess and lunch, and yeah. none of it's happening. None of it. Yeah. How many students do you have, Mark? Four hundred ten on site, ninety remote. Oh, that's a that's a pretty good number. Yeah, it's a little bigger than I think we have a little one. Well, we did have a little over 300 and now that's here yeah. and a little under 300. But they, they're so doing alternate days. One no. day Async and asynchronous and yeah. asynchronous teaching. Yeah. We're there every day, all kids every day. Oh yeah, that's a lot. And that's saying something that you don't have a case yet. That's well, they're all there every day also, but the yeah. classes yeah, are had, really into People class. stay home because they had symptoms, but we no nobody's tested positive yet. You know, everybody had stayed home, teacher, oh. student, and the ones that were around them in close proximity, they've stayed home till they get the test, but we haven't yet. I mean, it's going to happen eventually, but we haven't right. yet. Had so far, so good. Well, as far as the school, I don't think anything is going to happen there. Uh, everything right. is well protected, but outside right. of school. Is right. <laughs> uh, I think they're worried about holidays where people are going to travel. That's going to be a tough thing. Yeah. Yeah. Hmm. I was in the music ministry at that same church for 30 years, leading uh, contemporary and then ultra contemporary choirs and having a ball. But after 30 years, I wanted my weekends back. <laughs> <laughs> hmm. and, uh, and I'm an audiologist too, and I retired from that also. Oh. So we're retirees and having a great time. Good. <laughs> Good for you. Well, I'm trying to stay useful, I mean. <laughs> Yeah, that's a wonderful ministry. Trying to be useful. <laughs> Trying to be useful. It's a great ministry. Yeah, yeah we're not hanging around here loafing or anything. <laughs> so. Judy, would you like to introduce yourself? Okay. Uh, my name is Judy Moore, and uh, I've lived in Cincinnati since 1955. I am not a Cincinnati girl. I was born in Washington, D.C. Mm. My father worked uh, in the government, and during World War II, they uh, didn't want to keep central uh, headquarters in everybody. All the departments were right there in Washington, and they wanted to decentralize the government. So they set up regions, and uh, I was three weeks old when we went on a train to Asheville, North Carolina. Uh uh -huh. so, three weeks old? Three weeks old. I had another sister who was ill, and then I had a, an older brother at the time. And I slept in a uh, a bureau drawer. They didn't have big <laughs> beds. I slept in a bureau drawer. Same. And uh, we lived there till I was 10. But uh, uh, I hate to do this to you, Mark, but our family's got you beat. Uh -huh. I'm I'm one of seventeen. Oh my gosh! And <laughs> oh, <God. laughs> I, I heard that. Twelve girls and five brothers. Oh my gosh! Wow. Uh, but my older sister, the one who traveled with us, she died when she was two and a half, and I I didn't even know her. Mm -hmm. uh, I just heard about her. She was only two and a half when she died, and. Uh, it uh, it was very traumatic for my mother was a convert and my uh, she was Italian my father was Irish oh my and um, we had a baby every year I never had a doll we just got the real thing <laughs> and uh, when I was ten we got transferred to Cleveland and we were there for three years and then in fifty five we came to Cincinnati and we really liked Cincinnati it's a it's a friendly place, and uh, there are a lot of people that stayed here, but there's an awful lot of people that have moved around and come from other places. And Mark, did you say you're from Buffalo? Yeah, I was born in Buffalo. Well, I have two grandchildren in Rochester. Oh, yeah. I and uh, I hate going through Buffalo. 
oh, those those lines. And I finally did buy, buy one of those pass <laughs> things so we didn't have to wait. Uh, <laughs> the easy pass. Yes. But we haven't been up there. Uh, let's see. We went when my granddaughter graduated from high school. So it's been a year and a half since we've been up there. My oldest daughter, Karen, uh, uh, died of breast cancer in 2012. And that was the last place she and her husband lived. So he just stayed there in uh, Rochester. And uh, uh, Clara is uh, a senior at, um, oh, I always want to forget it. It's in Ithaca. Oh. That, that, um, Ithaca College or Cornell? Cornell. Cornell. Mm -hmm. I don't know why I have trouble thinking of that, but Greta's at the University of Pittsburgh, and she, she went home this week because a friend was going home, and they're doing virtual classes, so, sure. you know, she can do her stuff at home, and she gets to see her dad, mm -hmm. but if, if Clara goes from Ithaca to Rochester, she's not allowed back in Ithaca. Mm -hmm. I don't know there. I think she does get to come home at Thanksgiving, mm -hmm. I think. But um, I have another daughter. She also had breast cancer, and we found out that it was a familial thing. But it's on from my husband, not from me. Oh. And we don't have any cancer in my family. It's all heart attacks. Mm -hmm. <laughs> and uh, I have a son. He's, he's our baby. He'll be 48 next week. And uh, he's... Uh, He's been in the military since he graduated from college, but only uh, in reserves or gu uh, the guard. He's a major in the Indiana guard or the uh, Michigan guard. He used to be in Indiana, but he he's a uh, border guard in Detroit. So he's, you know, he's a government employee. And uh, I've just always been, I guess, a lifetime volunteer. I, I worked for the Episcopal Church for 10, 15 years, and that was fun because I was the resident RC. I found out that uh, they had names for us. <laughs> I, would, I would just laugh. They'd call me the resident RC, and I'd say, well, that's not the way we do it, but, you know, <laughs> we'll do it your way for right now. But I volunteered a lot at my church. I was in the choir for 30 years. I was bereavement 10 years, CCD teacher for 10 years, a lecturer, uh, communion distributor. Oh, like Alicia. <laughs> oh, and on parish council for nine years. Nice. So, and hot in the now, <laughs> now I volunteer down at St. Clair's Convent. I'm a Franciscan associate, and I love uh -huh. that. And we don't get to see the sisters much. They keep them over in the other part of the building. Uh. <laughs> oh, and something fun or funny. I never met a stranger. And I never have trouble talking. How about that, Julia? Remember? That's true. <laughs> you are, you know, you are a good friend and you, you do like to talk, but it's always a pleasure talking with you. It's always a ball gregarious and i'm glad to see you yeah I, I thought when i saw your name i thought well i call always called you julie but i guess you like to be called julia it doesn't matter <laughs> julia and laura yeah those are our formal names yeah, yeah. laura couldn't say julie. and it's the same amount of letters yeah laura, what'd you say mom we call you julia <laughs> so, they stuck. Julia. Yeah. Um, yeah, Laura was a, 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 about 17 years younger. And so she she wasn't very good at saying just she, Julie. No, she's not. She, she added on to it. Julia, she made a couple of more syllables out of the name. Well, that's nice. So it, it, kind of stuck. it has a, uh, a melody to it. Yeah. <laughs> Joe, did you have something to ask? No. Um, I, I was going to ask you, uh, Glen Mary's based in Cincinnati there. Yes. What, what kind of facility or staff is there? Beautiful. Quite a big or facility staff-wise, I guess? Um, or 
we are, you know, for the amount of work we do, I'm amazed at how small our staff is. It is. <laughs> so we do a lot of work, but it's because we're very, our staff is very dedicated. We have a diverse staff. We have several staff who are not Catholic, but mm. they're very committed to the mission. Um, and we work in an office building on the same property as where the senior or older Glen Mary priests and brothers live. They live on a house on the same property and they have a little chapel there where there's daily mass. And usually that's open to the public, but because of the pandemic, it's uh -oh. closed right now. They have and private you, mass. You used to have a lot of hands-on volunteers that did things. Yes. And we still have a couple, but like Mark said, because of the pandemic, we haven't had our volunteers coming because right. we, many of them are um, older and frail and we're just very concerned about their health. So um, if we can send them things to do at home, they're happy to do work from home for us. Sure. Um, but right now I'm actually picking up a lot of the extra work. Um, so I'm busy. I'm sure. So there's only a, what, a dozen of you or something or not even? Oh, there's probably, there's fewer than 20 of us, I would say. Oh. And ooh. then there's about 40 Glen Mary priests and brothers. Okay. Yeah, besides them. <laughs> yeah. So we have, um, at the office, we have a finance department, we have development, and then we have our president's office. Um, and we also have an archivist. Her name is Lucy. And, and don't forget about Rachel. Oh, and Rachel, yeah, she's a part of the development department. Um, so those are the two main departments that work out of the office building, but we all do a variety of things. We all contribute to the mission in different ways. Um, we talk to the missioners in the field, you know, every day, multiple times a day, because um, they always need help with different things. Um, and it's just, it's a real joy to work there. And it's a beautiful uh, campus. So when I was a uh, seminarian years ago with Glen Mary, you had offices in Nashville, you had the minor seminary in Dayton, and, but you also had some house in Connecticut. Are any of those places still in operation? Um, the one in Connecticut is not. Um, I believe we still have some lay employees who do some work in um, like parish, not revitalization, but bringing our mission parishes to life. Um, and they're in the Nashville area, I believe. Um, but a lot of the, when we had hundreds of Glen Mary priests, you know, they had regions and mm -hmm. houses in multiple places. They had a house in Washington, DC at one time. Um, now they've shrunk down quite a bit but we're starting to grow again. Mm -hmm. So we're expanding um, our house at St. Meinrad Seminary, where the young men currently go to seminary. Mm -hmm. um, Where's that? Where's St. Meinrad? St. Meinrad, I believe it's in Indiana. Mm. Yeah, it's a little bit Northern Indiana. Yeah. A, lot of the, a lot of the Franciscans have gone there. Yeah. And then we're starting a house of hospitality for young men who are interested in learning more about Glen Mary. And that is Brother Craig Digman's new ministry. And he will share about that on Sunday. Do you uh, still have the farm experience? Yes. Yes, but the farm is a little bit different now. It's not in the same place. It's not in Kentucky. It's moved to Eastern Tennessee at a place called Tapa Joppa Mountain. Mm -hmm. And it's a little bit different in its activities now, but it still has basically the same mission of reaching out to people and having young people come and parish groups come for a week of service um, in, a, in the Glen Mary style. Yeah, I got to do that in 1980 in Kentucky. Mm -hmm. Did you? How long have you been with Glen Mary yourself, Julia? About two years. It'll be oh, two okay. years in December. Because um, Father Jerry Dorn was the original Glen Mary, and I met, and you've probably heard a ton about Jerry Dorn. Yeah. yeah. But he was an amazing, um, an amazing priest. I guess he hadn't been a priest long when I met him. <laughs> he was a brother initially, and um, so when I went to the farm, he was one of the main, you know, people basically heading it up, and it was just incredible. 
So, you know, obviously it was sad to lose him. It was sad to lose him and it was sad to, to um, you know, have the farm change a bit. Uh, Julia, I thought they still had a place over in Flemingsburg. That might be the sisters, but not. No, 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 I thought Father Don said that there was still a place over there, but it's not the way it was. It's, it's, it's smaller. That might be true. I don't know. That they have a presence there. That's quite possible. But the, the big new place is the top of Joppa place. Right. Yeah. It's up on top of the mountain. Top of Joppa. Yes, it is. So my next question is, um, what inspired you to become a Glen Mary supporter? And some of you may have already answered this, so you don't have to answer it again. But if you'd like to answer, you're more than welcome, because I know for each of us, it's a different story. Well, I think I could say for me, it was having the Glen Mary priests fill in at our parish. Mm. Father Don would come, Father Chet would come, Father Neil would come, and they participated in, uh, in mass. Uh, they might even have done some baptisms, uh, but came to uh, confession services when we needed extra priests. And they just really made a hit with the uh, people in the parish. And, uh, I know I went to Easter Sunday Mass at uh, the chapel, Our Lady of the Fields, and the sermons are great, and it's it's very cozy, and we just liked it. And uh, but I would say it was their outreach in helping us. Yeah. Anybody else? I'm married into it. <laughs> she, 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 she married into it and I, I think uh i touched on um it was actually getting a glimpse of life in that palatia years ago yeah and some of the, and the children there and the poverty and all that that later i found out that glenn mary <laughs> that's where their mission was that's what they ministered to and so, so I discovered Appalachia first and then found out the Glen Mary organization is very involved there. And so that was my motivation for supporting them. Yes, that's beautiful. Yeah, that was one of the great things about the farm is, you know, coming from upstate New York and the Northeast to go into Appalachia and to see the different culture in, in all its aspects, as well as you say, in some cases, tremendous um, need. And to see this organization that basically, you know, was in there with their jeans and their, and their flannel shirts and their craftsmanship, helping people have indoor plumbing for the first time or having a second bedroom for the first time. I mean, it was just an amazing thing. So we were just laborers among their, more talented people and it was a real eye opener, but it was a lot of fun too, because you did a lot of singing and you had services and you met all these great people. So it was a pretty intense seven day immersion in Appalachia, you know, and with the people as well as with Glen Mary. So it was a really rich experience, eye opener, you know. That's you said you went to seminary, did you, did you graduate from there with just a degree or what? Oh, I had my Not, BS. Yeah, I did my BS work at a private, you know, like a college, but during my, between my junior and senior years, I felt I had a calling and I didn't really know what to do about it. And I, this was my first time I went into a diocesan seminary. And so I spent a year mm -hmm. after I got my BS in a diocesan seminary and it didn't really seem like a good fit. But at that time I met Jerry Dorn. He came visiting the college where I was in the diocesan seminary and I met Jerry Dorn, you know, for those of you who know him and I was, you know, I'll never forget him. And um, coincidentally, a, um, a chaplain, like a Newman Center college chaplain, put a Glen Mary brochure, just a simple piece of paper in my hand. It was just like a folded piece of paper and said, I think you would be interested in these. And I kept it. And so years later, in 1984, wow. I contacted Jerry and um, I was doing whale research at the time. And I basically said, I think it's time for me to take a look. And so I then went to 
Glenmary, but again, I went to the minor level since I didn't have enough background in philosophy and religious studies. I wasn't yet ready for graduate work. And so I spent a year, well, I spent half a year in Dayton where they had their minor seminary and half a year in Arkansas in, at a mission parish and had a really good long look. And I will say the big difference for me, the diocesan seminary where I was at that time, just speaking for one place at that time, they would do anything to keep you from leaving. <laughs> when I went to Glen Mary, they would be the first ones to tell you if you didn't have a vocation, which you know really made it the discernment process easier because you knew as you went through it, they were gonna be straight with you and they weren't gonna just you know try to keep you there. The diocesan seminary didn't want you to leave and it just never felt like um, they were necessarily trying to see the big picture in terms of your calling. But Glen Mary, you know, when I left, it was heartbreaking because I really loved Glen Mary. And yet they helped me. In fact, it's ironic. Um, when, you, when you're in Glen Mary and you're supposed to go into the novitiate, you have to have a, an interview. At that time, it was 30 minutes. Everybody comes to Cincinnati, you have a 30-minute interview, all these different seminarians. And I was last of the day. Oh. 30-minute interview went two hours. And oh. it was real hard. And, and at the end of it, they said to me that the three that were, you know, meeting me, Father Ruff and the other two said, you know, we think we'd like you to stay, but we agree. We don't think you're ready for novitiate, but you can pick any one of our missions if you want to stay another year. And I said, no, I think, I think you're right. I'm not ready, but I want to step away. Well, I leave the room. I step out of the room and three feet away, sitting on a bench is Jerry Dorn. I have no idea who's there. I sat down next to him. He probably knew I was an hour and a half late. <laughs> and uh -huh. I, found, I found out in the next few minutes, he had just been reassigned from vocation director to the parish I was in in Arkansas. If I had known going into that yeah. room that he was being assigned to Arkansas, I would not have been able to make a free decision to leave. And so I thought it was sort of a um, blessing that I didn't know because I never could have made a, what I would call a free decision because I just thought the world of him and I would, there's no way I would have left that parish. So as it turned out, I left and, um, you know, I'm married now and have kids, but, you know, I think about Glenmary all the time. Um, and it was, like I say, it was really helpful because as I discerned my vocation, like I say, they helped me make the decision I make. They didn't try to twist my arm to stay. And I will never right. forget that, you know what I mean? Because it was a really hard, hard decision to, Basically, for my first calling, if you want to call it that, in 78, it wasn't until May, April of 85 when I finally made the decision not to stay pursuing a wow. religious vocation between the diocesan and Glen Mary. So I always respected them much for that. And, and of course, Jerry was a big mm -hmm. part of all that. I don't think you're the only one that has happened. I know Father Don has told us stories that he came and went a couple times. And <laughs> And now he's going to lead up the new parish uh, outside of uh, Nashville in January. Mm -hmm. That was a beautiful story, Mark. Thank you for sharing. Oh yeah, I'm, I feel yeah. very, you know, I feel very lucky about it because even though I didn't stay, I gained so much from it, you know. And so. Oh yeah. Mm -hmm. And they'd love to have you come back and visit. Yeah. <laughs> yes. That's the other thing that's exciting. Have you seen Have you seen the new campus in Cincinnati, Mark? No, no. Oh, you went to the old one in Tri County. Eighty five. Yeah. Yeah. Oh, you'd you'd love the new place. It's. Uh, uh, you can go to mass it, it, when they have public mass, mm -hmm. and they have windows behind the altar, and uh, sometimes I get distracted because I'm watching the deer. <laughs> And they're walking around nuzzling or eating plants. And uh, also the red birds in the winter. I remember one time Father Neil was saying mass and this bird kept pecking on the, on the window. And it was a cardinal. And uh, it was, something had happened with, with one of the cardinals. I forget who it was. And Father, do you know Father Neil? Oh, oh he's clown. He's from Syracuse. Ah. Uh, and uh, he, yeah, he's a real clown. He's Irish and Italian too. And uh, he, he said something about that must be Cardinal so and so trying to give me a message. <laughs> <laughs> but it's, it's the nature is just beautiful. 
Well, you know, I think probably speaking for most of us or several of us, you know, as I look back through life, I think of, you know, obviously diocesan priests are a big part of your life. I'm a member of a diocese, a member of a parish. But honestly, when I look back, I think about the Sisters of Mercy when I was a kid in school. I think of, you know, Glen Mary, obviously, where I work now, Sisters of St. Joseph, where I am St. John's, you know, where I spent my first minor seminary was Bazillion Priests. I spent four months as a long-term guest at a Benedictine monastery. I mean, my life has been littered in wow. a positive mm -hmm. way with religious orders. Right. And so, you know, I'm deeply, um, deeply affected. Like as a kid, there was a D Dominican um, convent near our house. My mother occasionally would take us up there for mass and they were all, you know, cloistered nuns. And so, yeah, even though diocesan priests are in sort of in the middle of your weekly life, actually religious orders have been a big part of my spirituality, big part. <clears throat> Great. Good. So that brings me to my next question. Um, how does Glenn Mary contribute to your spiritual life? Oh, sorry. There you, go. you know, if it does. Mm. Um, I'm ready I know for spades. <laughs> in, in, what? Oh. in spades. Uh, I don't know. <laughs> Besides being a check to write and deduct, okay? <laughs> I mean, you know. Don't you want to just get out there and go to Tennessee and pick tomatoes? <laughs> <laughs> Not when you retire. <laughs> no, I, I don't do any backbreaking work anymore. <laughs> uh, well, are, are the volunteer you, work is easy. easy, well, easy. Anyway. You have them pass you the tomatoes. <laughs> they have the oh, best well. tomatoes in the world. <laughs> I, I never was a farmer or gardener. <laughs> uh, well, at least you keep the plants alive. I'm a black thumb person. I have silk plants, and they don't like yeah. me. <laughs> As far as Glen Mary, I, actually, there's other organizations that I support also. So, uh -huh. so Glen Mary is really not the only one. Sure, there's, there's Franciscans. Another, yeah, there's a handful. There's the Franciscans. Uh, I think I heard recently there's a hundred and forty-nine different orders of Franciscans. I'm not surprised. That's sisters and priests and friars. <laughs> But, but I found I would, if I'm going to go to Mass and hear a good sermon, um, uh, an order is going to give a much better sermon. Jesuit is going to give that. A Jesuit, maybe? A Jesuit. Is gonna... <laughs> uh, depends on who it is. <laughs> yeah, that's true. My father was brought up by, uh, he lived in a monastery for all of his young years from age 10 through graduation from the fathers of Betoram who run Lords, the shrine at Lords. Oh. So he was born, raised and educated by them. Mm. And uh, so we feel an affinity to them. They've done incredible things throughout the world. Um, I remember he used to, I don't, he never went, but he supported the missions in Thailand and things like that. So, and they're still there. And they're still there. <laughs> and they're still there. Yeah, well. That that's one thing about Glen Mary I like is they're here in the United States, mm -hmm. and I, I everybody thinks everybody thinks the United States has everything. Well, we do have everything, mm -hmm. but uh, there's a lot of people that need a little help, and you know they don't they don't judge people, and uh, to me they're more genuine you know get out there with the people you can't tell if he's a priest he's got blue jeans on and mud on his boots and his sleeves are rolled up and he's all sweaty and you don't know he's a priest but he is and you can tell from from his manner that's a beautiful reflection judy thank you then one of our actually our department meetings they asked us what do you think um makes Glen Mary compelling to our supporters or our donors. And I said, one of the things is we're genuine and we're authentic. And yeah, that's kind of right. what you're speaking to. So we appreciate that you can see that um, because we try very hard in our formation, even, you know, not just with the young ones, but with ongoing formation, like the, even the older members, they participate in theological reflection time and retreats. They're having their next theological reflection days next week. So that continued formation is really important to keep that 
um, true missioner spirit alive. Um, so it's really beautiful that you can see the fruits of that. Um, that's really compelling. So thank you. I, guess I can tell you a little story from when I went on my, my real missionary trip three years ago down in Maynardsville. And it was after we'd done all the stuff and all that. And we went to dinner and it was at a, a Mexican restaurant. Authentic, they said, authentic. <laughs> and um, there, I think there were two seminarians that came and I was sitting next to this one fellow and he was from, I think Nigeria. Mm -hmm. And I asked him, I said, do you know who I'm talking about, Jason? I don't know. Oh, okay. If I saw him, I would know him. And he was in his 30s. And, you know, he had done all this education and this and that. And he just didn't know which way he wanted to go. And uh, I said to him, I said, you're from Africa. Why are you coming here to the United States to be a missionary? And he said, well, when I was growing up, I grew up in a missionary school mm -hmm. and American priests and sisters came and they taught. And he says, it's my way of giving back. And I thought, oh my goodness. And, uh, oh, he was a soccer player too. He could play good soccer. Mm -hmm. But it, it was interesting that, you know, he said, yeah, I, I want to give back to the people that gave to us. And that's actually what many of our missionary students who come from Africa will say. That's what, that's what inspires them to come here to work as a missionary. It's because missionary congregations were a part of their education or their health care or their parish ministries, and they want to give back. Um, and so they come and work in a mission, as a missionary here in our country, um, which is a beautiful thing. So I guess we've got about 15 minutes. I guess my last question would be, what were some takeaways from Father Dan's talk, if you happen to listen, um, that you thought were you know, compelling or life-changing for you, made you think? Um, and then maybe we'll have time for another question, but I think- I think I think Mark and I will have to pass. Right. <laughs> and I don't remember. Uh, well, he talked about we go where nobody else wants to go. Yeah, you know, that's the first place we sign up. That's the first place we sign up. Send us to the worst place that no one wants to go, or no one would rather not would rather not go. It's like those home yeah. improvement shows. Give yeah. us the rattiest animal. Yeah. <laughs> Mom and Dad, what do you remember? Do you remember anything? I think that was what struck me the most, how he said Glen Mary priests. Usually uh, Glen Mary looks for the poorest parishes, those with the most need, and with the fewest Catholics in the area. Mm -hmm. um, obviously, Pope Francis, he has really emphasized uh, you know, yes. uh, uh, evangelizing people. And I think that's one thing the Glen Marys are very good at when they go into these areas. Obviously, it's a lot more of people see how they are and see what they do. And it's not what they say, it's how they behave and how they treat people that makes people say, I want to be part of that group. You know, I, I want to help them. You know, I want to become a Catholic too, without people jumping on them all the time saying, you know, you need to do, you need to become a Catholic. You need to get baptized. I think so. some of the evangelicals have kind of a strong arm on a lot of people of having to declare that Jesus is their Lord and Savior. And I think more people that are influenced by the Glen Marys are influenced in a way of what they see. Um, their action. You know, I was greatly influenced by my parents. We were farmers. We, uh, farm, uh, you know, Iowa farmers do not irrigate. We are totally dependent on Mother Nature. And so <clears throat> our, our, our living for the year was based on that one crop we got off of the summer. And so we worked as children. We were kind of child labor. We had to go out in the fields very early in the morning 
and work. Um, we had soybeans, corn, and oats. I don't know what you guys grew. Same thing. Yeah, and um, it was hard labor. We would be out there, start, we'd start about five in the morning, and it was coolest then. And then we would come in, um, we'd walk back to the house by um, around noon. We would have lunch and then go back to the field until mid-afternoon when it was really getting hot. Um, <clears throat> And then we were done for the for then. We would come in and kind of have some play time. And uh, after dinner, when the sun had gone down, we would all go, the whole family would go back again. Wow. And work. You know, Do it all over again. We, we were <laughs> hand weeding. We used a, a hoe and a corn knife to cut out weeds. It, it was after the farm equipment, the cultivator could no longer pass through without knocking crops over. Oh. But um, you, you learned very early on that you were a part of a, of a group. You know, you, you weren't just, you, you had to do your share even when you were very young. You know, you, you didn't just get a place at the table and a bed to sleep in. You, you had to do something. Mm -hmm. um, yeah. Well, it was interesting, you mentioned um, sort of the example of seeing people do stuff and, and seeing Catholic ministries in some cases doing things. I didn't hear Father Dan's talk, but I'm involved in my parish today with the RCIA program. And if you guys are familiar with it, you know that, you know, we have these people coming that are either totally unchurched or often from Protestant denominations. And it's amazing to me, we've had a couple of very articulate people in the last few years it's amazing how many nod their heads when somebody will say, well, when I grew up, we really didn't think Catholics were even Christians. Or when I grew up, you know, we thought Catholics were sort of a cult. Or when I grew up, we thought Catholics were sort of the, you were talking about the worst parishes, the worst people. They were saying, we thought they were like the worst possible Christians. And um, it's interesting some of them, they came to the Catholic Church in some cases through seeing Catholic ministries. Like one gentleman had spent a lot of time in Central America and he kept bumping into Catholics who were doing things with the poor there and other people who have seen different ministries. And, and a lot of times that's the hook where they take a closer look, where they see beyond what they were taught or what their siblings or what their family says. In many cases, they go against family members. So it's always really interesting to me because it's, you know, growing up as a cradle Catholic, I'm like, what are you talking about? A culture, non-Christian, it's, it's, it doesn't make any sense, but from their point of view, it's all they knew. And so they're sort of fascinated by the Catholic faith once they get more involved. And although parishes are, are important and vibrant and wonderful in terms of diocese, if you have any kind of rubbing elbows with, religious groups, you really get to get a feel for yeah. Catholic charisms and the variety of them. And if you've never heard of a woman named um, Kathleen Norris, maybe some of you from the Midwest know of her. She was raised, I think, Presbyterian. She had you know, family members who were maybe ministers in the church. But twice she, she was a writer, and twice she went and spent long periods of time in Minnesota at a Benedictine monastery where she participated in all the, the, you know, the office every day, and she wrote about it. And although she remained non-Catholic, you know, she got this rich influx of Catholic um, religious spirituality at this monastery. And so she would reflect on, on this, you know, when she first went, she probably was thinking, oh my gosh, what am I doing in a Catholic place? And then she found just how rich it was. So I think that when people are lucky enough to, to bump into something that's a little less uh, highbrow and a little more just down among the people that really have needs, they do learn a lot about what some great Catholicism is about. And a lot of times it's religious orders who are quietly in the background doing some of the greatest work. Um, your average diocesan person, thank God, I've seen a lot of dioceses and parishes in recent years have had a spirituality revival. But a lot of times if you're in a diocese and you're in a parish, it's mostly a Sunday experience or a little bit beyond that. But if you get involved with like a Franciscan order, like I'm currently in a Carmelite secular group, you know, you really, have a chance to deepen your faith and understand the bigger picture better. And, and I think as Catholics in general, we're lucky when we bump into that. And um, so anyway, it's... Did you say her name was Kathleen Norris? Norris, N-O-R-R-I-S. 
the book, the first book I read by her was called Cloister Walk. It's about her experience going, because she's a poet and a writer by nature. And she spent 180 days at a Benedictine monastery in Minnesota and wrote about it. She has another one called Dakota. I think she originally grew up in the Dakotas. And uh, so anyway, it's very interesting to see this woman who's a poet, a Presbyterian, and has like a female minister in her family go and experience a Catholic experience at a, at a religious order and write about what it's done to her and, and her, you know, how it's changed her faith. And so anyway, I just think that we're lucky when Glen Mary's out there and other ministries are out there and they're doing these things quietly. Just by example. People who notice them take notice and they're like, what is this about? You know, and this isn't what I was taught or this is what I heard about Catholics. It's a really great thing, you know. Mm -hmm. Well, you know about Thomas Merton. Sure. sure. And yeah. I have a lot of non-Catholic clergy that would go to Gethsemane for retreats and mm -hmm. they would stay for a month or they could stay for a week however long it didn't it didn't matter and Gethsemane's in Kentucky and uh, uh, Mark maybe you know I forget the order that they were Trappists probably that's right Trappists that's right 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 and they do more than make fruitcake Oh yeah. No, when I stayed for four months at the Benedictine Monastery in New York, the prior was a MASH doctor from Korean War and was still a practicing physician for the community. They had a guy with a patch over his eye that lost an eye in World War II. He was their accountant. They had a, a pig farmer from Minnesota. They had a guy who was the son of like Miss America or something. That, um, they had a diocesan priest who had asked to be relieved of his duties and was a... Um, his brother Elijah with his long red beard. They had um, all kind. It was just an amazing mix of very normal people who had come to this monastery. And I stayed for four months and was able to participate very fully, and you know, be immersed and really become you know as much as you can as a guest, a part of their community. And it was just amazing, amazing experience. I mean, it's just you know, unforgettable the way it weaves itself into your into your story. You know, I mean. <clears throat> You have a big, bright quilt. <laughs> yeah. Like that flag. Well, any final comments or questions? Yes, a big one. We love the flag in the background. That is so. Oh, big. I thought that was the quilt. <laughs> oh no, no. This is a. Oh, it's bigger. It's it, my son. When he was uh, stationed in Balad in Iraq, it flew over the base. Oh, it's behind St. Francis over here. I don't think you can see it. Uh, but it flew over the air base at Balad. And uh, he had it uh, embroidered and sent it to his dad for his birthday. Uh, it was his second tour, I think. And I didn't want to fold it up and put it in a drawer. Yeah. And my husband's a 30-year Army man. My daughter, who passed away, uh, was a naval officer. She married a submarine officer. <laughs> I had three brothers in the Marines and a brother-in-law in the Coast Guard. So I got a flag flying out front in the yard. Right. And uh, it flies 24-7. And mm -hmm. But this one, I wanted on the wall. So... Mm -hmm. I probably ought to take it down and shake the dust out of it. <laughs> <laughs> Once every other year. <laughs> oh. So we'll see you tomorrow. <laughs> yes. What we'll time to think tomorrow? Okay. What time tomorrow so I'm not late? Okay. Um, tomorrow, the first activity is at 11.15 Eastern Time. It's a tour of Holy Family Mission with Father Vic. Oh, good. Okay. okay, and how long will that be? It'll be about an hour. 45 yes. minutes of him giving a presentation and 15 minutes for questions, but it may be shorter oh. than that. It just depends on how long Father Vic wants to talk. Okay. Do, does, does he talk about the mission? Do we get a sense of touring the mission? He will, take, he will take his phone and have a younger person who knows phones better 
um, actually <laughs> touring around with. So um, I actually practiced with each of the missioners before we started this experience just to see and make sure everything was okay. So um, he's going to give a little bit of a talk on his laptop and then he's actually going to have someone take a phone and tour you around the church and maybe some of the outside and just explain the different things that were donated because a lot of the things in Glen Mary Mission Churches are donated from other churches that are closing or other things like or are made by people. And so you'll have that and Father Vic will walk along and tell the story of those different things. Um, oh, good. Sounds good. <laughs> that's our next activity. It's at 11.15 Eastern time in the morning. Okay, and then is there one later in the day? Yes. Um, Judy, I'll actually type it out and send it to you so it's easier for you. Yeah. Maybe just take a picture of it with your phone and send it as a text message. Okay. To my cell phone number. Okay. Okay, that would be good. I can do that. I did okay. get your box with the program in it. Oh, great. <laughs> yesterday. That's what it says. Yeah. So they it back. Thank you. Yep. You're welcome. Thank you, Julie. You're Thank welcome. You, Julie. We'll see you tomorrow. All right. We'll see you all tomorrow. Have a good night's rest. Okay. Bye-bye. Bye. -bye. Thank you. Bye. Little sweetheart. Bye. Bye, honey.